Welcome everyone. Today we're taking a look at an up-to-date Germany speedrun in Hearts of Iron 4. But the actual highlight of the show is our attempt at clowning on the current state of US foreign policy in the game. These days it's just a shadow of its former self and I'll demonstrate just why that is. As always I'm playing on the latest version of the game in Iron Man mode with regular difficulty, no mods and all DLCs enabled. I already showcased a speedrun against the Allies as Germany a while ago in which we utilize naval invasion against France and the UK. But since beating the Allies is not the main focus of today's video, we're going to use Blitzkrieg tactics and paratroopers. We respectively choose electronic mechanical engineering and paratroopers as our research and order the construction of a couple of military factories across the country. Our existing factories are needed to produce more infantry equipment. The run is too short to even mess with templates, so we'll focus on mass production instead. Same goes for our dockyards. We won't assign our divisions to front lines just yet. The placement of divisions, fleets and air wings that I do here is just a habit of mine that I do pretty much every run. What does matter is recruiting a couple more divisions as line filler. 30 cavalry divisions should suffice. With the first step out of the way, we now need to accumulate some political power. I'll assume that you're familiar with the basics of the game and won't go too much into detail about minor aspects of the run. After accumulating 50 political power, we can now justify a war goal against the United States, which increases world tension slowly over time and also pick Rhineland as our first focus. Increasing world tension quickly has been nerfed heavily to the point that we're more or less left with just stacking justifications. Both regular spiking as well as array spiking have been removed, but are of course still available in older versions of the game. At the end of January, we do what's called tech juggling. By swapping our current research into the unused slots that have built up a buffer of 30 days, we reduce the research time of both electronic mechanical engineering as well as paratroopers. What other research we pick is irrelevant to the run. This also holds true for which upgrades we pick for the intelligence agency. Around one month later, we deploy all divisions that are currently in training and begin setting up front lines for our first offensive. Czechoslovakia, due to their entanglement of guarantees, will be joining the war on the Allies' side immediately. To avoid having to set aside plenty of divisions just to garrison the rather long border, we'll remove Czechoslovakia from the board with a fast push into their most valuable victory points to force a quick surrender. While the war against them won't be overly fascinating, it's still a great example on how to utilize terrain to your advantage. The majority of the border provinces are hills and mountains with fortified positions. We are able to just brute force our way through with close air support and superior divisions, but that's costly and takes time. Instead, we're going to make use of two corridors that aren't heavily defended, lead into more favorable terrain and, given that we can successfully exploit the breach, open up a way towards the high value victory points. 12 of the 30 cavalry divisions that we recruited have been assigned to the border with Czechoslovakia. Another 8 moved to an airport north of Dortmund and the remaining 10 will man the border with France. The next thing on our to-do list is to dismantle the axis which we can do right away since the faction has no other members. At the same time, we get our first operative and order him to build a spy network in the Soviet Union. We don't need to do that to achieve our goals for the run, but it's beneficial if you want to transition into an all-majors campaign afterwards. A few days later, the Rhineland focus finishes. It provides us with an additional 120 political power and increases wall tension by 5%. We now have enough political power to hire the backroom stabber who lowers the time and cost to justify war goals by 25%. We'll use that modifier and the increased world tension to re-justify on the United States. The shorter duration of the justification means that tension will rise faster. We're halfway to our target of 40% world tension. It's the magic barrier after which we can do something called force ally, a technique to form a faction with otherwise unwilling partners and a cornerstone for our strategy. Before we get to that, we begin justifying a war goal on the Soviet Union after accumulating another 50 political power to further increase tension, although not by much. But any increase counts because of how the event that we seek to trigger works. You see, while Yugoslavia has the anti-German national spirit, an event will fire if they are on the same faction as Germany. The event has two possible outcomes, a civil war in Yugoslavia or a war goal for Germany against them. We of course want to get the latter. At the moment Yugoslavia isn't quite willing to form a faction with us just yet, but that's due to a tiny difference between positive and negative opinion on the matter, which we can correct in our favor by improving relations with them. All that's left now is reaching 40% world tension. If you have an idea on how to further increase tension up to this point, let me know in the comments. The fact that we can only create a faction with Yugo on May 7 means that we're missing an earlier window of opportunity by just two days since the event will always fire at the end of a two-week period 
and the previous one just ended on the 5th, meaning the next possible date on which the event will trigger is now the 19th. Please know that the outcome of the event is random and only changes if you start a new save or wait for a different two week period to trigger the event. Here's an example of the outcome we do not want, a civil war in Yugoslavia. It can also be exploited, but not as quickly. In our actual run we instead get the coup in Yugo that rewards us with an immediate war goal against them. At this time their independence is guaranteed by France, Czechoslovakia and Romania, who will all join the war against us right away after we declare on Yugoslavia. Our campaign into Czechoslovakia is going to unfold without any additional input. Only at the start are we going to manually give orders to those divisions that can instantly cross the border and pour behind enemy lines. The basic principle behind the manual orders is taking over the main VPs around Prague and to get to Bratislava before Czech defenders can dig in. Now that we're at war with a major nation, France in this case, we get a big reduction in time and cost needed to justify war goals. But even with this modifier we cannot get the justification time below 25 days yet since war tension isn't high enough. Without additional modifiers that are very circumstantial, Germany generally cannot get the justification time below 15 days, which is why it's not perfectly suited for world conquest speedruns. That's different with Japan and Italy since both have national spirits that get the time down to the absolute minimum of 10 days. One example of these circumstantial modifiers is land leasing to an enemy of ours. It counts as assisting the enemy and reduces the time needed to justify by another 25%. The Netherlands and Belgium have a high chance of offering equipment to our enemies at this point, but it's not fully reliable and only happens a few days after the war begins. I switch back and forth between the two countries to quickly catch any land lease, but it really is only worth it if you are optimizing down to days. Being lucky and having both the Netherlands and Belgium send out land lease saves 20 days in total, since the circumstantial modifier on top of high world tension being at war with a major nation and having the backroom stabber reduces justification time to just 10 days. We need to cancel the ongoing justifications against the United States and the Soviets of course. Just like some generals in the game, I'm too stubborn and proud to make changes to what I consider a perfect plan. So if you ever wondered what the inflexible strategist trait actually looks like, this is it. I do not intervene in the war with Czechoslovakia, although manual corrections would speed things up a bit, never mind the frontline chaos resulting in lack of coverage and roaming enemy divisions. After the justification against the Netherlands finishes, we start another one against Belgium. Shortly after, Czechoslovakia surrenders and since they aren't in any faction, we get a peace conference right away. As usual, we just annex everything. Our main army is now going to take care of Belgium, while the other one will have to hold our territory to the east against Romania and later Poland. Close air support is extremely powerful in the current iteration of the game. So much so that we can just right click the Netherlands despite having no planning bonus nor max organization. Because the Netherlands have since been guaranteed by the United Kingdom, we're now at war with them and their dominion too. I was contemplating doing something about the French tourist group in the Rhineland, but since we're very close to unlocking paratroopers anyway, I decided to not bother. After our war goal on Belgium, we begin justifying against Poland. There are no additional modifiers involved, leading to the regular 50 day justification time now that world tension is pretty much maxed out. A little later and the paratrooper research is done. We swap the 8 cavalry divisions previously positioned at an airport, to which we also sent Germany's 80 transport planes that they start with, to the paratrooper template and plan the paradrop orders into northern France. If you instead prefer a ground invasion, make sure to station your troops near Ghent and to rush important French victory points from there. It works most of the time, but not always, hence why I chose the more reliable method of aerial assaults. We execute the order right away, but don't have sufficient air superiority to launch. But after the Netherlands surrendered, we can move our plane wings closer to the center of the air zone, thus getting better coverage and achieving air superiority. France falls quickly as expected. We also right click Belgium and move the cavalry army from the Maginot line to the east to support the fallback line. It's now finally time to talk about today's star of the show, the Americas. Subsequent to the war goal on Poland, we begin a justification against Brazil. It only takes 10 days since they've granted military access to France and the United Kingdom, which also counts as assisting the enemy. Some democratic countries in South and Central America provide land lease or military access to members of the Allies and therefore can also be justified on in just 10 days. But we won't declare on any of the American nations just yet. First we need to make it across the English Channel, which we achieve again with paratroopers. They just need to take any port for our regular army to be able to cross. 
While there are some more nations in Central America that are assisting the enemy, we instead take aim at the much larger and important countries such as Argentina. We've pretty much achieved the setup we needed in Europe at this point. All that's left is taking over most of Britain, but leaving one or two high value victory points to gain full control over when and how the war ends and the peace conference begins. As our talented Mr. Hinkle told us in the beginning, the United States has a serious issue with their foreign policy at the moment. The country pack, fittingly named Trial of Allegiance, fundamentally changes how the Monroe Doctrine, a cornerstone of the non-intervention policy of the time, is implemented in the game. Just as in real life the Monroe Doctrine declares that any aggression into the Americas by nations from overseas will result in the United States getting involved. Without the new country pack this is represented by security guarantees. But with Trial of Allegiance enabled the system is a bit more complex and therefore exploitable. But before we get to that we use our second agent to begin a collaboration government mission in the Soviet Union. Again I won't be playing beyond the actual point of today's video but if you'd like to see this run expanded into a full all majors campaign let me know in the comments. With that in mind Mexico would be nice to have right? So let's justify on them too. And just because we can we do Cuba next. We declare war on Poland at the end of August when the Casas belly on them is about to expire and begin justifying against Honduras. Same as for Cuba there really isn't any strategic reason for them to be targeted but they will help to bring my point across. In early September we follow up with a justification against Costa Rica and we make use of all outstanding war goals before the one on Brazil runs out. With the Monroe Doctrine and the forms of security guarantees we'd now be at war with the United States immediately but Trial of Allegiance changes this to a decision based system which does not convey the same deterrence because of how decisions work in Hearts of Iron 4. If the conditions for this kind of event are met the decision will pop up within 7 days. Each declaration of war against a country under the Monroe Doctrine triggers its own series of events that now appear one after the other. We're confronted with the decision to either sign a white peace with the country that we're at war with or accept that the United States enters the war against us. But here's the kicker. To accommodate playing on high game speeds decisions just as research and focuses too come with a grace period, 14 days in this case. After the time has passed the decision will automatically resolve with the default option which is immediate white peace. But 14 days is a lot of time, more than enough to end an ongoing war actually. In fact we can even wait for our war goal on Costa Rica to finalize before finally marching into London to end the war. All countries on the opposing side have joined the allies and with France already surrendered the United Kingdom was the last major nation that needed to capitulate for a peace conference that includes all members of the allies to fire. Since we don't have to compete with other nations over limited points we end up with a lot of score and can easily annex every country and take their navies as a cherry on top. If you don't know why we were able to annex so many countries at once during the peace deal I recommend that you watch my recent world conquest speedrun commentary. The decisions from the Monroe Doctrine are still active, just not present in the peace conference screen. After it is over we bow before the imposing might of the United States and agree to end hostilities with nations that no longer exist. Very intimidating indeed. I hope you enjoyed the speedrun and little excursion into exploiting the Monroe Doctrine. If the interest is there the follow up into an all major sequel will be released soon. Oh and come join my new discord if you want to chat and hang out. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.